I'd like to welcome you to the Santa Fe Distinguished Lecture Series. I'm Ron Duncan Hart, and it's my pleasure to give a warm greeting to all of you from across the United States and Canada and the UK, to Israel and other countries. The conversation today with Philippe Sands and Bonnie Ellinger will focus on Professor Sands' new book, The Rat Line, The Exalted Life and Mysterious Death of a Nazi Fugitive. This is a book that I heartily recommend. And if you have not uh, seen it, um, I totally recommend that you look for a copy. We especially want to thank all the contributors who make these programs possible. Philippe Sands is a professor of the public understanding of law at the University College of London and a leading international legal authority on crimes against humanity. He's the author of 17 books on international law. And his last book, East West Street, on the origins of genocide and crimes against humanity, has been widely acclaimed, winning an incredible seven prestigious international best book awards. Professor Sands is president of English Pen, and he's a frequent contributor to CNN and the BBC World Service. He is a friend of Santa Fe, and we welcome him to this conversation with Dr. Ellinger, who is a retired professor of English from Barilan University, a PhD in applied linguistics, and an active analyst of Jewish writing in English. She's from Brooklyn, lived in Israel for 35 years, and now resides in Santa Fe. Professor Sands, and Dr. Ellinger, we welcome you to the Santa Fe Distinguished Lecture Series. Thank you very much, Ron. Professor Sands, we are thrilled to be able to interview you for the Santa Fe Distinguished Lecture Series about the rat line, which is riveting and meticulously researched. May I call you Philippe? Please, please do if I can call you Bonnie, and it's uh, oh, very you. lovely to be here. As Ron said, I am a friend of Santa Fe's. I actually had my honeymoon in Santa Fe, and I retain amazingly happy memories of being here. Well, great. So we will have a wonderful memory from today's interview, I'm sure. So let's begin. In the rat line, you describe both a personal and historical journey of about a decade to discover who the Nazi fugitive Otto Wechter was. How did this all begin? What was your motivation for devoting so much time out of your busy career as an international human rights attorney and professor? Sure. Well, Bonnie, I mean, I'll give you the short version okay. um, because I can go on for hours about it. I was carrying on my normal life, uh, doing cases in court, teaching at the university, uh, other bits and bobs, when I got an invitation to go to this Ukrainian city called Lviv. And I accepted because Lviv was Lvov and Lemberg, and it's where my grandfather was born in 1904. And I went to give a lecture on the cases that I do on crimes against humanity and genocide, Rwanda, Yugoslavia, various other places. And uh, by the time I arrived, I'd worked out that the two concepts, crimes against humanity and genocide, had actually originated in the work of two men who came from that city. I thought that was pretty remarkable. I started writing a book about them and my grandfather, Leon, having found the house where he lived and then came across a fourth man who was the fourth character in East West Street, Hans Frank, Adolf Hitler's personal lawyer and then governor general of Nazi occupied Poland. In researching Hans Frank, I came across the name Otto Wechter. Wechter is not well known in you know, public conversations about that period. He's essentially been whitewashed out of history, but he's a very important character. He was the governor of Krakow. He oversaw the construction of the Krakow ghetto, and he was then governor of District Galicia in Lemberg, and he oversaw the extermination of more than half a million Jews and Poles, including my grandfather's entire family. I became interested in Wechter, and in doing the research, I had met Hans Frank's son and, and got to know him pretty well, actually. We've become pretty good friends, distinguished German journalist, Nicholas Frank. And at a certain point, Nicholas said, you know, you're interested in Lemberg. Would you like to meet the son of my father's deputy, Otto Wechter? I said, yes. 
I traveled to Austria with Nick, met him, liked him, uh, noticed that as Nick had warned, Nick hates his father, uh, Horse loves his father and his mother, and uh, one thing led to another. I wrote an article for the Financial Times about seven years ago, eight years ago. Um, we made a documentary film that you can see. Uh, it's on iTunes and Amazon and so on and so forth. My Nazi Legacy, what our fathers did, the, rela our, the relationship between the three of us. And at a certain moment in making the film, uh, Nicholas said to me on camera, you know, I think Horst Fechter could be the new kind of Nazi. And I, I disagreed with that. Horst is not a Nazi or an anti-Semite or even a denier of the Holocaust or anything like that. He's just someone, as he likes to put it, who tries to find the good in his father. And But he was very upset by what Nicholas said. And he said to me, how can I prove I'm not a Nazi? I thought about it and I said, well, you've got all these documents. I'd only seen one or two letters, a few photographs, but he had 10,000 pages of his mother and father's archive. I said, give it to a museum. And he did. And that material is now publicly available at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. You can go on the website, just type in Vechter Archive, uh, and you'll be able to go through it. We spent five years going through it. I was assisted by some wonderful research assistants. It's all in German, I have to say, as a warning. Um, and um, a story emerged about the relationship between Otto and Charlotte, and that's the beating heart of the book. And I, I can attest to the fact that in the rat line in the book, it is some story. It is, it, it is absolutely fascinating and one uh, cannot put it down. And the connections that you mention in the book that you talk about and, uh, are quite unbelievable. That um, for example, uh, the two men who were responsible for the terms genocide and crimes against humanity, the two lawyers, uh, were had their family sent to the concentration camps from Lindbergh. I mean, I mean, it's a story I tell in East West Street. You literally could not invent it. Okay. Um, the two men, Hirsch Lauterpacht, becomes professor of law at Cambridge University. Uh, Raphael Lemkin becomes a public uh, a prosecutor, moves to Duke University in North Carolina. And they are then hired by the prosecution and they prosecute Hans Frank. And when the trial opens on the 20th of November, 1945, they do not know that the man they are prosecuting, Hans Frank, is responsible for the killings of their entire families, mm. as well as my grandfather's family. And so, you know, it's fact is stranger than fiction. It is an extraordinary moment in international justice and of course it's the moment when the concepts of crimes against humanity and genocide come into being but of course Otto Wächter never was caught yeah. and that's really the second half of the rat line what happens to those who escaped exactly and we'll get to that we will get to that so um you mentioned the rat line what is the rat line the rat line has as its official title the Reich migratory route and it sort of emerged in about 1946, 47, as the escape route from Italy to South America for senior Nazis, many of whom had been indicted for mass murder. Many of the people who are watching this program, and I express my happiness that you're on, thank you for coming to listen, uh, you know the names, Joseph Mengele, Adolf Eichmann, Klaus Barbie, but there were thousands and thousands of others. And Wächter, who escaped on the 9th of May, 1945, when the war in Europe came to an end, hid in the mountains for three years, quite close to his wife, who would help him out with a young SS soldier, Burkhard Hartmann. And then in the autumn of 48, tells Hartmann he wants to go to South America where he will be safe. He wants to go to Argentina. He obtains false identification. Alfred, he becomes Alfredo Reinhardt. He makes his way to Rome. He is welcomed by a senior Vatican bishop, infamous, notorious, Alois Hudal, spends three months in Rome, but, uh, spoiler alert, um, never makes it to Rome, okay. uh, never makes it out of Rome spoiler to Argentina. Alert, spoiler alert. Okay, good. I'm, glad, I'm very glad you said that. Okay, getting back to, to Vector, um, 
and everything that he did and the powerful career that he had, which, I mean, he, he rose in the ranks uh, so quickly and became so powerful. Um, what do you think were the characteristics that made him able to be such a powerful Nazi? Not everybody was a very powerful Nazi. Some were <laughs> kind of low level. How did he yeah, get this is yeah. This is a highly intelligent, highly educated, highly cultured individual. His father had been a government minister and a general uh, during, during you know, the Emperor's uh, Second World War failed uh, war. Um, he enters university actually on the same day as Hirsch Lauterpacht, unbelievably, yeah. um, in 1919, a century ago. And 25 years later, he will oversee the killing of his university colleagues' entire family. I mean, you literally couldn't invent it. He's an anti-Semite through the beliefs of his father, a nationalist German. Uh, they do not like the Ostjuden who are flooding into uh, Austria on their accounts after the collapse uh, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He joins the National Socialist Party very early in 1923. Around that time, he's also convicted for attacking, for beating up Jews. He becomes a commercial lawyer. And by the early 1930s, he's doing the work of the outlawed National Socialist Party in Austria. And in 1934, by now he's married and he leads the coup attempt against the Austrian Chancellor Engelbert Dolfus. He flees and goes to Berlin where he joins the SS and he comes into the orbit of Heinrich Himmler and Reinhard Heydrich. Um, Himmler had a particular penchant, it could be said, for smart lawyers. And uh, he took him under his wing and became Vechtor's mentor. And we have that in all the diaries and all the correspondence, a very close relationship. And then, of course, in 1938, in March, comes the Anschluss, the Germans march into Austria, and Vechtor returns. And that's where the rise to power really begins in a shocking and frightening way. Okay. Oh, good. Well, thank you for filling in some of the, the details. Um, I'd like to go to um, family life, a bit of his family life. And um, I'd like to talk about Charlotte, uh, who is, as you mentioned, uh, a very important character in this whole story. Um, she's a key part of the narrative of the rat line. And we know a great deal about her because she kept a diary for decades. She dotted on Otto, bore him six children, ignored his many affairs, and enabled his life as an extremely powerful Nazi. Was she clueless about what was happening? Was she just plain cruel? Was she in denial? Did she typify a certain characteristic of the Nazi wife? Um, she was in many ways a remarkable and ghastly human being. Um, mm. She was very intelligent. She was probably bipolar. She knew everything that her husband was up to and she egged him on. She was deeply anti-Semitic. And as her daughter-in-law told me when I met Horst on the second or third time, she was an anti-Semite and a Nazi until the day she died in 1985. Let me give you a flavor of this lady because the book is also in a shocking way, a love story. Um, in 1936, so two years after Wächter has fled Austria, indicted for treason, the killing of the Austrian chancellor, he goes to Berlin and she joins him two years later in 36. With two, with, she brings the two youngest children, the firstborns, and she discovers that he's having an affair with a young German lady called Trauter. She writes about all of this in her diaries. Mm -hmm. To punish her husband, and she is a powerful lady, when she falls pregnant a year later and bears their third child and their first daughter, she, uh, so it's their second daughter, she names the daughter Tauter after her husband's mistress. 
and writes to him in a letter, that'll teach you a lesson about what you get up to. Two years later, she stands on the balcony of the Heldenplatz in Vienna uh, with her husband, Otto. And as she describes in her memoir, her, her diaries, I stood one meter from the Fuhrer. And she then describes what happens after that famous balcony scene is over. They all go inside, they go down the big mar marble staircase. And at the bottom of the big marble staircase inside, I've been, you, you may have seen it also, Bonnie, I don't know if you've been inside, it's the Hofburg Palace. Otto stops and says to her, my darling, uh, we've had a wonderful day. I now have a choice. I can continue my life as a successful lawyer, or I could accept the offer made to me by our friend Arthur Seiss Ingvart, the new governor of Nazi occupied Austria, and join the government. What should I do? And at that crucial point, this comes to your question, while she's a sort of innocent observer, she is the one who says, take the job in government. And of course, she had the power at that point to say, this is all a nonsense, it's a disgrace. You must have nothing to do with this. Stay out of it. Frankly, frankly, it brings to mind, in a sense, the battle that is underway in the heart of the Republican Party in the United States, where, where there is a struggle, you know, as to whether you do the right thing or follow the power. She wanted the power. She wanted the Mercedes. She wanted the apartments. She wanted the villas. She wanted the receptions, the cocktails, Salzburg, Bayreuth and she pushed her husband. She knew everything, Bonnie. She was absolutely complicit in the murders in which he was engaged. You know, she, she does write in her diary after that infamous balcony scene that uh, her meeting Hitler was the most important moment of her life. Yeah. And I thought that was, Astounding. Maybe it's not astounding. For well, her. you know, if you go, if you go, Bonnie, if you go to the end of her life, I describe this in the book. She was remarkable. So her husband well, might come back to this. Her husband dies in 1949 in mysterious circumstances in Rome. She devotes the rest of her life, 36 years, to the veneration of her husband's memory. And so, for example, every time an Austrian uh, radio broadcast says something about her husband was involved in the killing of the Jews, she writes a letter to the Austrian broadcasting authorities. But she went beyond that. She wanted to, if you like, produce a sort of whitewashed version of her husband for the children. And so she went around between 1975 and the early 1980s, finding uh, the colleagues of her husband who were still alive and interviewing them. And Horst gave me the tapes. And there is one remarkable one from 1977. So this is 30 years after the end of the war, 30 years after the Nazis have been vanquished. She's in the Four Seasons Hotel in the restaurant, having lunch with a Nazi journalist um, called Melita Wiedemann, infamous, notorious uh, Nazi. And you hear the clinking of the glasses and the raising of the toasts, and then, Charlotte says, those really were, those were the good old days, weren't they, my dear? And Melita says, yes, they were. And she says, I, I, I loved Hitler then, still, still do actually. And Melita says, yes, me too. Still a Nazi, always will be. And you get a feel that this was the, these years of her life from 1938 to 1945 were the great years of her life. And that's what is so shocking. There's no, sense of recognition of the horrors that her husband was involved in. It was all a lifetime of cover-up thereafter. And of course, the children became part of that. Uh, Philippe, from what I understand, um, uh, Otto had no regrets, never expressed any regret for anything he had done. Uh, but I, I did read in the book that Hans Frank uh, who was uh, convicted, tried, and hanged mm. Nuremberg, he expressed regret, whatever that means, right? You know, he, the noose was about to, to, uh, to be placed in the mm. proper place. Uh, and so um, 
I just thought that was interesting that he never actually it's it's very subtle what happens um you it's very important to understand these were highly educated highly intelligent individuals Hans Frank never really expressed regret what he expressed was responsibility for what had happened in other words uh, but, but he didn't accept individual responsibility. He accepted collective responsibility. His line in court in May 1946, so exactly, literally 75 years ago in two weeks' time, he says in the Nuremberg famous trial, I was part of the system, therefore I'm responsible. I accept my responsibility, and the German people must accept their responsibility. But he never accepted his own individual responsibility. And for me, that's a vital distinction. It's the same distinction as exists between crimes against humanity and genocide. Crimes against humanity is about the protection of individuals. Genocide is about the protection of groups. And this balance that we all ask ourselves, who are we? How do we define ourselves? Are we individuals first and foremost? Are we members of a group first and foremost? Is it a bit of both? Frank accepted his responsibility. So there was regret in that sense. But he recanted right at the end of the trial well, he recanted okay well they took care of him so yeah. so that was good um a question about your relationship with horst was it emotionally difficult for you to spend so much time with horse you say that you liked him you said in the book that you liked him uh did you believe that the evidence and documents that you shared with him would convince him that his father was a war criminal and was one of your goals in writing the rat line, your attempt to puncture the notion that the Nazis were basically fine people caught up in a difficult situation and just following orders? That's, that's Horst's line, that his father was essentially a decent person. Right. And he would say to me time and time again, Philippe, there's no proof. So I'm a litigator and proof, you know, is my middle name in a funny sort of way. That's what we're about in court. We've got to prove things. So I thought, OK, I'm going to show you what your father did. You're trying to persuade me that your father was a decent guy. I'm going to try to persuade you he wasn't such a decent guy. And gradually I gathered materials, including indictments by the Americans and the Poles. You've seen them in the, in the book and also a series of shocking photographs where his father is literally overseeing the execution of 50 boys. Um, absolutely shocking images. But the more I showed him, the more I found, the more Horst dug in his heels. And, uh, you know, at a certain point when we were making the film, I was anxious about where I might be leading him to. And so I got some help from a psychoanalyst and a psychiatrist and, the psychoanalyst in particular said to me, Philippe, you know, you need to be very careful. He's like the Schloss, the castle in which he lives. Mm -hmm. The walls on the outside, hundreds of years old, very solid. It looks impregnable. It looks strong. It looks terrific. But when you go inside, you see that it's on the verge of collapse. And I came to understand that Horst's veneration of his father was a defense mechanism. And his, it's really actually the story is not the love of the father it's the love of the mother because he loved his mother so much and because the mother loved the father there is a sort of transference and at times yes frankly it has been very very difficult um you know there is a time in lemberg when i'm there with him and nicholas and i show him certain documents and he is in absolute denial about them and that denial continues and then uh, a few weeks later there was an absolutely shocking uh, time when we went again outside Lemberg and we went to a recreation of a World War II battle where the SS division that Wächter his father had created is sort of reconstituted annually as a celebration of the father and I find myself in a field in western Ukraine surrounded by hundreds of individuals wearing Waffen SS uniforms and Horst is thrilled Horst is absolutely thrilled by this because they venerate his father and he describes it as one of the best days of his life. So I lose my rag with him on a couple of occasions. You'll see that in the film. But for the most part, my sort of barrister academic training is don't show any emotion, stay cool, try to understand him. 
and that's that, that's the major part of our relationship. A lot of people have said, I don't know how you can have spent so much time, but but it is what I'm trained to do in court, and it's what I'm trained to do in the classroom. So um, I think I was well equipped to deal with that. But of course, let's not forget there's a very personal element in this story for me because his father was involved in the killing of my grandfather's entire family. So it, it really doesn't get much more personal than that. And yet I thought it was important to retain a courtesy and a civility and a decency because he's not responsible for what his father did. He's a victim in a sense of that period. He is responsible for keeping his eyes open to the truth, however, uh, and his denial is, is disconcerting. Yes. and painful frankly yes of course of course we know what his daughter said magdalena daughter or granddaughter daughter daughter daughter, daughter. i mean this is very dramatic the last sentence of your book can we give it away we can we can yeah. um My i mean the, the last the last sentence of the book i mean i should just provide some context for those of you who listen to podcasts if you want to if you want more of this you can go onto the BBC website and go just type in for a podcast called uh, The Rat Line, and you will find uh, a 10 part. It's free to listen to, you don't have to pay a penny. 10 30 minute episodes, you'll hear Magdalena, you'll, 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 you'll hear uh, Horse, you won't hear Magdalena, you'll hear Horse, you'll hear Charlotta, you'll, you'll hear the marvelous Laura Linney reading the letters of, um, the letters of, uh, of Charlotta and the equally marvelous Stephen Fry reading the letters and diaries uh, of, um, of Otto. About an hour after episode 10 was broadcast on the web, I received an email uh, from uh, Horst's only child, his daughter Magdalene. And she basically said, you're right, my father is wrong. My grandfather was a mass murderer. And that's the line with which the book ends. And as a consequence of that sentence in the book, those six words, Horst has now disinherited his daughter. Yes. So these feelings, very strong, they go on tremendously. Yes, um, I have, I'd like to ask you a question. This is related to your grandfather, <laughs> excuse me. Um, and of course you've told us that um, 80 members of his family were murdered in the Holocaust. And um, <clears throat> he did not talk to you. You had a relationship with your grandfather. Very he close, very, very close. Uh, very, as, as it has to be with a grandfather, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, he did not talk about the war and you did not ask. Mm -hmm. So my question is, or my statement, as an age, as, as we age, it seems that a common regret is that we didn't ask enough questions mm. of our elders. Are you comfortable talking about that? Yes, no, I, thank, you for, thank you for your generosity in raising it. No, I'm completely comfortable. To, I think it's very important to talk about it. You know, I grew up in, in an incredibly loving family. Um, I, was, I loved my grandfather, he loved me. We were very, very close. Same with my mother, um, my grandparents, daughter she my mother was a hidden child in France throughout throughout the war throughout German occupied Paris my grandfather was born in Lemberg fled to Vienna when the when the Russians took over in the first world war and then left Vienna in 1939 and his daughter and wife followed and East West Street is in part the story of that separate journey as they made to Paris mm -hmm. and when I was a kid growing up you know I grew up in London and my grandparents lived in Paris I loved going to stay with them next to the Gare du Nord. They had a little little apartment. They were they were impecunious. They had you know regular folk and decent yeah. regular folk who who struggled to get by. And um, and my brother and I understood that you didn't ask questions about what had happened. We knew something had happened, obviously, but it was the thing that was not talked about. And um, and I understand that. It's, there's no criticism on my part at all. I think it was a protective, loving silence. But I think in the end, silence does more harm than good. And in fact, I begin East West Street with a quotation from a couple of uh, Hungarian psychoanalysts. W what haunts 
is the gaps caused by the secrets of others. And I believe that grandparents have a means of passing on to their grandchildren information about what happened. And many years passed before I, I chased that. I mean, when I was my kid's age, my kids are in the 20s, they, of course, get on with their lives. They've got, you know, today to live. Why would you get into these stories from the past? It was that invitation that I got from the University in Lviv that suddenly cat catalyzed a desire to know. And to this day, I've come to understand that one of my greatest regrets in my life is that I never said to my grandfather, what was your mother like? Oh, it's painful. No, yeah, it's painful. No, what, what, tell me about, tell me about your mother. What was she like, and how was she? And um, I think, I think a lot of people who are on this call will understand exactly what it is that I'm talking about. And so you're caught between the silence of respect and protection, and the desire to know more. And it's a complex. I should say, from the cases that I do. It's not a Holocaust thing. It's not a Jewish, German, Ukrainian, Polish thing. It's a universal thing. I've done cases of mass murder around the world, and it happens everywhere. Some of the most touching letters I've had on my books, which have been translated into many languages. For example, a Cambodian young man wrote to me and just said, the story you tell in East West Street, the story of silence, is the same story in Cambodia. And I've had that all over the world, okay. all over the world. And that's, that's very moving. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, we can't talk about the rat line in the Holocaust without mentioning the complicity of the Catholic Church. What can you tell us about the connections? Uh, we don't have that much time. But right. Well, it's, it's, yeah. about the well it's unfortunately, it's not just the complicity of the Catholic Church, but it's the complicity of the British and the Americans. Um, because it turns out, and again, I won't give too much away, but in writing this book, I stumbled across the extraordinary, um, for me, discovery. I don't claim originality. Uh, wonderful academics, Norman Goder and David Kurtzer had been US academics who'd helped me enormously in the writing of this book uh, had, had been aware of it, that the rat line was known about and supported by um, the Americans and the British uh, who used it as a recruitment tool. Um, one of the things that was remarkable for me about the trove of materials was that for the first time, I, I think it's unique material. We have the inside private correspondence of a man on the run hunted, indicted for genocide and crimes against humanity, trying to get to Argentina, and we've got all his letters. They're all anonymized because he was scared he was being watched. In fact, it turned out the Americans knew where he was from the moment he set foot in Rome. The Americans had eyes on him. And this caused me, in fact, as I describe in the book, to go and see my neighbor, uh, John le Carre, uh, who sadly passed away quite recently, who was there in 1949, interrogating Germans and Nazis, not to prosecute them, but to recruit them. And this is the terrible story. And maybe this is a moment, Bonnie, where I can reveal the Santa Fe, or the, the New Mexico link. You know, um, I, just, I just made a note that this is when I want to ask you okay. about the connection to okay. New Mexico. Okay, so um, this was really surprising. Um, you might ask, what's all of this got to do to, with New Mexico? So it turned out that in 1947, the United States Army created a uh, counterintelligence corps unit to look for Nazis, not to prosecute them, but to recruit them in the new struggle against the Soviets, the Bolsheviks, the communists. That unit was headed by uh, an American army man called Thomas Lucid. And so I became interested in Thomas Lucid, who was hunting Otto Vector to recruit him. Thomas Lucid died many years ago, but I tracked down his son, who lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico, an absolutely wonderful man, also named Thomas Lucid. And so, wanting to know more about the story, and four years ago, I flew from London to Albuquerque, New Mexico, to meet with Tom Lucid Jr. And I 
met a man of intelligence and decency who was very open in sharing with me the life of his father, who was a Nazi hunter, but also a Nazi recruiter, uh, an intelligence man. Uh, and sitting in Tom's kitchen, his bungalow in Albuquerque, not so far from Santa Fe, Tom went and got a range of documents. His father was the man who arrested Mrs. Himmler and the daughter, Gudrun, in May 1945. And Tom Jr. said to me, my dad helped himself to a few um, mementos, shall we say, from the Himmler household. And he brought them back home to America and he gave them, some of them to me. Would you like to see them? And I said, sure, I'd love to see them. So he goes off and gets you know, some boxes and bags and brings them out, lays them out. And I'm astonished by what I find in New Mexico. The item that interested me the most was this one. Let me put it up on the screen so everyone can see it. So what you are looking at is an original. It's not a copy. This resides today in Albuquerque, New Mexico. On the right hand side, you can see Weihnachten 1943, Christmas 1943. And on the left hand side, you see the name Adolf Hitler and the insignia. This is the personal Christmas card from Adolf Hitler to the Himmler family, thanking them for all their fine work. And at the bottom, you can see, unbelievably, that is the personal signature of Adolf Hitler. So I have to confess that in writing this book, I never expected to end up in New Mexico. And when I arrived in New Mexico, I never expected to end up holding Adolf Hitler's Christmas card to the Himmlers from 1943. Life is very strange, Bonnie, very strange. Very strange and, and, and very interesting. I have two more questions because we, have, we will have to get to the audience that wants to ask many questions, I'm sure. Um, the first question is, what is the most important takeaway from all you have learned from writing The Rat Line? What would you like your readers to retain? That's a wonderful question, Bonnie. Um, what I would like my readers to retain is that family is incredibly important. And it's within the family that so many decisions are taken. Otto Wächter married Charlotte. She could have stopped all of this if she had wanted to. And she chose not to. And it's a story of family complicity, not just of turning a blind eye, but egging on her husband. Um, it's a story of a man supported by a woman who kept on crossing lines. And every time the lines were crossed, the skies did not fall in. He carried on up the greasy pole. It starts off with joining the party. Then you're beating up a few Jews. Then you're launching a coup d'etat on the Austrian chancellor. Then you're throwing Jews out of jobs including your own teachers in Vienna when you come back after the Anschluss, then you're governor of Krakow, then you're building ghettos, and then the next thing you know, you're engaged in mass murder on an industrial scale. At any point, Otto Wächter's wife could have said, Otto Wächter could have said, enough. This is terrible, what's going on. And it didn't happen, and Charlotte was complicit in that. And again, I've mentioned earlier, and what I say is not at all in a party political sense, but I watched what happened. As I mentioned to you, Bonnie and Ron, I'm married to an American. My wife's American. My kids are Americans. I watched what happened on the 6th of January with a sense of horror and deja vu. And I watched the remarkable video made by a Republican governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger, which he put out two or three days after the events of the 6th of January. And he said in that video, 
I wrote a piece about it in the New Yorker magazine. I'm Austrian. I know about these things. Be very careful. And I think the United States right now is in an immensely dangerous position. And that is why there is a struggle that is going on. And the crossing of lines by certain people right now is immensely dangerous because one thing always leads to another. Do not cross lines. That's the central message of this book. It's horrifying to see the comparisons uh, between what happened then and what could happen now, or what has started to happen in some way. Um, my last question, Philippe, and I'm, I'm sorry we don't have another hour, but you know, there are other people out there who want some of your time, so I'm going to have to give them some of it. Um, the last question, the rat line begins with two very powerful quotes. The first from Isaiah chapter 13, verse 18, talks about the slaughter of young men, babies, and children. The second from Javier Cercas says it's more important to understand the butcher than the victim. At the end of the rat line, are we closer to understanding the butcher? We're closer to understanding this butcher and this butcher's wife. Oh. And one of the things that I've learned from my practice doing international cases is that it is usually from the tiny points of detail, including individual stories, that one is sometimes able to glean the bigger truths. I mean, you are a woman of literature, Bonnie, you understand what it is that I'm saying, why stories matter, why literature matters, because we are able to divine or to derive from points of detail, bigger lessons from which hopefully we learn. And I think we know what happened to the vegetables. Whether that helps us prevent more wet vegetables coming into being is of course, the $64 million question. We have, it seems, a tendency historically to go round and round in circles uh, and not learn from our past uh, mistakes. But I think what's happened here is I now have a pretty good sense of what motivated the vectors, Charlotte and Otto. And I think we do understand them and we understand how to individuals who started off life gentle, loving, educated, cultured, how they became mass murderers. And I think it raises the fundamental question, is all of us, are each of us capable of doing this? Um, or, 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 or is it something inherent in particular people? And that's a question I can't answer. Um, but it's, 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 it's the beating heart of this story. It's the beating heart of that whole terrible episode in history. Mm. How could it happen? How could it and happen? can it happen again? Mm. Yes, well, <laughs> um, I think now we'll, we will go to the other questions, Philippe, but I will see you at the very end of the questions. So Ron, would you like to take over the question part from the audience? Okay. Yes, thank you, Bonnie. Um, the, there is a question about, uh, you had mentioned um, crimes against humanity, Hirsch Lauterpark and uh, his role. And what's, and there is something that comes out of this in terms of what's been happening in recent years about international courts. And the, there seems to be a growing ability to prosecute crimes against humanity. I know you're deeply involved in it. Could you speak? to that, what, what's happening in recent years? Well, I mean, for 50 years after Nuremberg, nothing happened. Uh, and then in 1993, 1994, we had the horrors of Rwanda and Yugoslavia, and it catalyzed a desire for action, having failed to prevent those terrible stories. Um, the desire for action was catalyzed and two, the first two new international criminal tribunals since Nuremberg and Tokyo was set up in 
1994, 95, Yugoslav and Rwanda tribunals, and then the International Criminal Court came into being, and then Senator Pinochet was arrested in London in 98. And all of a sudden, the subject came up. And now it seems almost a day doesn't pass without crimes against humanity and genocide being in the news. You'll have noticed this past weekend, the US president characterized what had happened to the Armenians at the hands of the Ottoman Empire as a genocide. That had not happened before. And we talk a lot about what's going on to the Uyghur community. Is it a crime against humanity? Is it a genocide? What are the Chinese doing to them? So I think these concepts are here to stay, but we shouldn't be starry-eyed. Um, courts have a very limited uh, jurisdiction um, and they are not, uh, as in the case of murder or other domestic crimes, by any means uh, comprehensive in their scope. So I'd say there are modest improvements, but I'm not starry-eyed and there's a lot of work still to be done. You know, I tell my students the idea of international criminal justice, crimes against humanity and genocide, it, it's, it, we're in the medieval era. It's, it's a multi-century project. You can't expect to invent these concepts in 1945 and then all of a sudden governments and mass murderers are going to go, oh, sorry, we're going to stop. We're not going to do any more of this kind of stuff. It goes on and it will go on and it's a long game. And um, one has to be sanguine about our um, expectations. But the arc of history is long and the trajectory, I think, is generally a positive one, but it's far from perfect. Yes, yeah. Um, we have a question now, the Q&A, um, about the book God's Bankers by Posner. Um, do you can you comment on that? You know, I haven't read the book, so I can't uh, I can't comment on it. I, I, I'd have to do a little bit of uh, um, a little bit of research on it. So I'm afraid uh, because I haven't I haven't come up um, with it. I know it's about money and the Vatican. Um, right. I know there's a great deal of interest. I should say that I was helped enormously by a wonderful Irish bishop. Uh, and a wonderful Portuguese cardinal uh, who have helped me. I wanted, as you know, both of you having read the book, I wanted to see the room in which Vechter died. Uh, it's a 15th century room. It's one of the first hospitals in human history. Um, the Santo Spirito, if any of your viewers have been to Rome, you will have been to it or you'll have walked past it. It's an extraordinary place. Um, and it was run by the Vatican, and I wanted to know how it was that Wächter was given refuge by a Vatican-run uh, institution. He died in the arms uh, of a bishop. We don't know what Pius XII did or did not know uh, about it. Um, but I think the record of the Vatican in this period is not either absolutely black or absolutely white. Um, it's shades of grey. Pius XII did some decent things, but he also did some very bad things. And uh, I think now that the secret archive has been opened last year by Pope Francis, in the coming years, we'll come to know more about the money side of things, God's banker, and also about the escape side of things. Um, but it's just too early to tell. Like any community, you know, it's a mixed cast of characters, I would say. Um, and one, I, I don't talk about the Vatican helping Otto Wächter. I talk about a Vatican bishop helping Wächter. Again, I, the focus is on the individual rather than the group. We know there were other people in the Vatican at the time who were doing incredible things to help and save Jews. So one has to be very, very careful about this subject. Continuing on that thought a little bit, um, Stephen Sass has a, a question about, uh, he says, it, it's about your comment about uh, the making of a mass murder and crossing lines. Can you assess the importance of anti-Semitism versus a, a drive for wealth and power in making von Vector a yeah. mass murderer? Yeah, no, that's a and, really interesting question. Um, I mean, I, I think Wächter's 
Otto Wächter's primary motivation was essentially ideological. It was a, an extreme form of nationalism. Um, yes, um, he gathered art and buildings and properties and baubles, but I don't think on the basis of the correspondence, he was the driving force for that. I think Charlotte was the driving force. You know, for example, there's an extraordinary moment in December 1939, Otto Wächter has just been made governor of Krakow and Charlotte turns up at the National Museum. I mean, the equivalent of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in Krakow, an extraordinary museum. I mean, you're not talking about some, you know, tiny little town, one room museum. You're talking about a museum with paintings by Leonardo, by Bruegel, by Dürer. I mean, extraordinary material. And Charlotte arrives carrying a piece of paper which says, my husband, the governor, has said I can take anything I want for the family home. And she gathers up art and she keeps it. When they leave, she holds on to it and she gives items to her children when they get married. So she is a looter and a plunderer. She is assisted by her husband, but I don't think he was driven by the lust for money. I think he enjoyed the power. Absolutely, there's plenty of evidence of that. There's an extraordinary letter he writes. I mean, this is the beauty of having these personal letters because people put into personal letters things they don't put into public documents. So he describes in August 1942, he's in Lemberg and Himmler comes to visit. And the reason Himmler comes to visit is that um, Himmler has heard that perhaps Wächter is having doubts about implementing the final solution in the district Galicia. And, he, and Himmler wants to see for himself whether Wächter is really up to the task of murdering hundreds of thousands of people. And Wächter writes to Charlotte about the visit and describes how Himmler, how marvelous it was having him. It was almost embarrassing how nice he was to me and how much we agreed and how perfect the day was. It's terrible to read this stuff. And then I went into the archives in Berlin and found Himmler's report back home, which is shocking because what it says is, I've been to see Wächter today in Lemberg. I gave him an opportunity to go back to Vienna and do a desk job. In other words, stay away from the killing fields. He declined and says he wants to stay. Okay, so between the public correspondence in the formal files and the private correspondence, you get a composite picture. He loves being with Himmler. He loves being the governor. He's gonna deliver mass murder. He's given an opportunity to basically go home and get out of there and he turns it down. But I think he turns it down for ideological reasons and he turns it down because his wife wants him to turn it down because his wife loves, loves, loves the Mercedes and the power. She's going to concerts, she's going to theater, she's nobbing with rich and powerful writers and people and industrialists. She loves it, she absolutely loves it. Wow. It's, it's shocking, it is wow. When you read this stuff, it's really shocking stuff. It's really, I'm afraid it's very shocking. You know, there are a couple of people uh, who have commented uh, back and forth between the chat and the Q&A uh, that their families were either from Lemberg or slightly outside who are on the program today. Mm. And uh, so this, of course, this is new and yes. their families, in, in both yes. cases, their families were able to get out before, uh, before the Nazi occupation, but, but they're from there. Um, we do have a, a, a question that goes back to your reference to some of the events in the United States recently. Um, would you char characterize what happened to George Floyd as a crime against humanity, um, or as a, or does this get into the issue of genocide because of the the African American sure. nature of the problem? Sure. I mean, it's interesting. You you mentioned uh, Ron a few days ago. I was on the um, um, Farid Zakaria program, and to comment 
uh, or my reaction to President Biden declaring the mass killing of the Armenians, which Lemkin saw as a genocide, as a genocide. And uh, one of the things that I said on that program was, you know, what would be more interesting in a sense would be if President Biden said, look, I've looked back on our treatment of African-Americans, I've looked back on our treatment of, uh, of Native Americans, and I think we've fallen way short. And frankly, I think um, in the case of the Native Americans, that's probably genocidal. In the case of African-Americans, Blacks, some of it verges on crime against humanity. And indeed, a report has just come out um, on discrimination in the US uh, over decades, which has characterized the treatment of African-Americans post-slavery as amounting to a crime against humanity. You know, you have to be very careful when you use the word genocide. It has in, there's a sort of political meaning. Some people think genocide is the mass mistreatment of people on a large scale or the killing of people on a large scale. I mean, it could be, but it's, it's not what it is in legal terms. In legal terms, genocide is the, the killing of people, the intention to destroy a group in whole or in part. And you have to show that requisite intent. And that's very, very difficult to prove. Um, I mean, I also come from a country, look, I'm British. Um, you're having your torrid and complex and very difficult uh, conversation in the United States about what's going on on matters of race. Britain it hasn't even begun to have it. You know, my 21 year old daughter is in her third year at Leeds University doing her degree in history and she's done her final year extended essay, her dissertation on, on Britain and slavery. And it's a fascinating read actually, where her thesis is basically Britain spends an awful lot of time um, saying how great it is as the country that abolished slavery, but says nothing about it being the inventor of slavery and the mass perpetrator of slavery. So I think one of the things that this writing causes me to reflect on is that no, no country has a monopoly on decency and humanity and wisdom. We've all got skeletons. You know, every community has skeletons. And one of the things that writing these books has caused me to do is to reflect on my own country, Britain, um, and its failure to engage with some of the historical excesses of the past. Now, it's very difficult. As individuals, we find it difficult to say we did terrible things. As communities, we find it difficult to say we did terrible things. And I think one of the striking things about the period I write about is how Germany has dealt with its past. It is remarkable. Uh, by contrast, I have to say, Austria has not dealt with its past. I mean, many of the people who were in the famous Nuremberg trial were Otto Wächter's friends and they were Austrians. And Austria has not engaged yeah. with the Nazi period as Germany has. So, uh, the reason that I say this is I'm very nervous and loath as a Brit to be going around the world telling people how to behave, given the British behavior, you know that as well as anyone in the United States, has on occasion been absolutely appalling and criminal. Um, and there isn't much of a recognition of that. You know, I have another question coming. Um, Carol Newman asked, going back to your references earlier to uh, uh, Carlotta, um, am I way off or do I hear you saying that she is, is she more guilty than her husband? Or are you talking about it being an equal guilt between the two of them? No, I think, I mean, this is a really interesting question. I mean, I, you know, um, I, I've, 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 I've got to say, Carol, having spent now 10 years immersed in the Vectors, I oscillate on this relationship. But it, I think I'd answer your important question in this way. It was plain to me that it was really a relationship. There was a power balance and a power struggle between this couple. And the relationship lasted 20 years from the moment they met on the 6th of April, 1929, on a train leaving a station in Vienna to the moment he died in July, 1949. And for the first 15 years, it's plain that the, the heart of a lot, lot of the formal power resides in Otto. But the moment the war ends, Charlotte becomes the powerful one. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. And I think they played off each other in different ways. I think 
the point that I made earlier was that Charlotta had the capacity to say to her husband on March the 15th, 1938, enough with this nonsense. Stop. Go and be a lawyer. Stay out of politics. Don't get involved in what's coming. And he would have done it, I believe. And if he had done it, the situation for the six children and the 23 grandchildren would have been completely different. And so I think she bears, in the family sense, a high degree of responsibility for what happened. She egged her husband on. There's no possible way of interpreting the documents differently. But at the end of the day, she didn't build the Krakow ghetto. She didn't round up the Jews in Lemberg. Her husband did. She exonerated him when he came home and told her what he'd done at the office that day. And he did tell her what he'd done in the office. We know that from the letters. And in that sense, I think there is a complicity, but I wouldn't say that she's the more responsible. She goes on to, Carol Newman goes on to say, my mother's family was from Limburg, mm -hmm. Lowe, left in the 1890s. This is powerful material, material, horrifying and enlightening, thanks to Philippe Sands. So, well, Carol, I mean, thank you for that. That's very generous of you. I know from my own family experience how difficult and painful this material is. And I know also that I'm lucky because I've had 30 years of being in courtrooms. And so I've developed the sort of defense mechanisms for dealing with this kind of stuff. It's, it is, it is, it's very, very painful to get to know the, who the perpetrators are. But I think we have to do it because we can't just call these people monsters. This is the terrible reality of the situation. They were also capable of love and decency and humanity. And that's coming back to a question that came earlier. I can't remember if it was Bonnie or Ron who put it. That's the problem with these kinds of stories. It, 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 you can't just put them in the category of saying, oh, they're monstrous people. They did monstrous things, monstrous, monstrous things. But at the same time, they were going to concerts, listening to Beethoven, writing love letters, looking after the children, feeding, partying, being gentle, looking after their parents. They were human beings. And, and I it comes back to the Javier Cercas quote. It doesn't serve us well to simply label the monsters. We need to get into the material and understand how they permitted themselves to do the monstrous things that they did. And they were monstrous, monstrous. Following up on that, uh, Marcia Saltz has a question about, um, she, she's wondering if there were psychological issues that allowed people to become mass murderers. I'm just having a wonderful conversation with a colleague of mine, um, um, at, at, at University College London, who is um, the professor of psychopathy, psychopaths. She's just read The Rat Line and, and we're about to go on a walk next week. We haven't decided whether she'll take the train to Hampstead Heath or I'll take the train to Richmond Park, but we'll do one or the other and we will spend a long time walking because she's devoted her life to understanding. Um, the raw material. She has patience. She deals with people. She, you know, what causes people to do terrible things? My instinct is that there was nothing inherent in Charlotte or Otto that caused them to do this. The, the, the horrible truth is, I think they were regular sort of folk and they could have gone at crucial moments on a different path and not immerse themselves in these horrors. Now, my colleague at UCL may, reading the material, come to a different conclusion. And I, I need to learn from that because I'm not an expert on that. But, but my, my, my anxiety is that these are more regular folk than not. And that's what's so worrisome about it. It always ends up being, I can tell you from my own cases, horror and mass murder happen. It always begins, as Primo Levi said, 
when you focus on the other. They're not like us. They're different. That's how it begins. And from that, everything follows. And in the case of the Vechters, it took a terrible turn. But that is how it began. If you go back to the early correspondence, to the diaries, to the letters, it's, it's a sort of them and us type of situation. And the terrible truth is, we're all familiar with that. We're familiar with that with our own communities. We're familiar with that in our own families. We're familiar with that in ourselves sometimes. And, and, and I think that's why I say that ultimately the seed is within each of us and why we have to take absolute, absolute care and, and try to engage in courteous and decent and civilized ways, even with people we disagree with, to try to treat them as respectfully as we possibly can. Sometimes it's very difficult. Nuri Pat, who's a psychiatrist uh, in, in, a, in a part of this program, um, makes the comment that this is not only complicity, but it's a shared pathology between this couple. Um, her comment, her evaluation of it, you know, so. Well, um, I mean, I, I mean, I, you know, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a Nuri, I'm, I'm really not an expert in this area. I'm just a lawyer and we're, we're good at gathering. We're gatherers, we gather, facts and stories and we string them together but understanding them but it that absolutely resonates for me they were absolutely bonded and you get it uh, perhaps this is uh, you know uh, worth mentioning briefly with what happens after Vechter's death he dies in Rome and um, 10 years after he dies he's buried in Rome Charlotte attends the burial in the, in the Catholic cemetery, uh, Central Cemetery in Verano, I've been to the space. Um, 10 years later, Bishop Udar calls her and says, look, Frau Wächter, Baroness Wächter, I forgot to tell you that as your husband was dying in my arms, he told me that he wanted to be buried in the homeland. Maybe you should come and get him and rebury him in Austria. So she makes an application to exhume the body and take it back uh, with her to Austria. Permission is refused because you can only exhume for reburial in another part of Italy. So she decides she will build a mausoleum for her husband in Sicily, where her daughter lives, having married an Italian. So she goes to Rome, they exhume the body, they put the body in a big tin casket in the car. And the next thing that we know is the body disappears. So how do I know this? Because in the documents that Horst has given me are press cuttings from German newspapers from 1960 describing the search by Interpol for the body of the uh, Nazi governor Otto Wächter that has disappeared. Having been taken out of the ground, it has disappeared. Mm -hmm. And then the trail goes cold. So I, I say to Horst, well, what happened? What, what happened? He looks at me, he smiles, and he says, mother brought him home. And I said to him, well, what do you mean mother brought him home? And he says, well, she brought him to the house where we were living then, House Wartenberg, and she buried him in the garden. I said, what do you mean she buried him in the garden? Literally, she said, yes. Hmm. And this is in the book. And it has generated an extraordinary amount of correspondence because House Wartenberg, if any of you go to Salzburg, go and visit House Wartenberg. It still exists. It's still a pension, a little hotel run by the grandsons of the Wächter. And Charlotte ran a German language school from the 1950s onwards, all the way through to the 70s. And a lot of people were there in the 60s. And a lot of those people who were there have now written to me having read the book and said, oh my word, I had no idea that Otto Wächter was buried under my, the window of my, my residence, my room. Then Charlotte moves to another house in a small town called Fieberbrunn and she takes him again out of the ground and brings him to the new house and buries him under her window. Now, Nurit, you may have expertise in this. 
That sounds to me like pretty pathological behavior. And it also indicates a degree of complicity on her part in terms of her connection with her husband. But it's beyond my pay grade to assess and interpret the extent of these horrors. So I leave it to you, Nurit, and, and others to work out what on earth is going on here. You know, of course, you're mentioning now um, the what happened, who killed him in the end. Um, and I that's one of the things that the end of the book deals with that extensively. But you might want to comment that um, there, there were many candidates uh, who might be possibilities from um, Simon Wiesenthal to the Americans at one point were suggested, uh, you know, so there were, I don't know if you want to com comment on the, on the, who were the candidates? That well, just, people, um, yeah. just, just briefly, um, Horst, Horst and Charlotte were absolutely convinced that Papa was murdered by someone. Right. But Horst right. almost doesn't right. care who it was. But but the beauty of dad being murdered is that he becomes a victim, not just a perpetrator, which is a theory that was spun initially by Bishop Alois Udall, who writes it in his memoir that was published posthumously after his death. I mean, the alternative theory, which I have to say I'm more partial to, is that Otto loved to go swimming in the Tiber. It was heavily polluted and he picked up a disease called leptospirosis, Viles disease. Um, a nice irony there, and Weil was a very successful German Jewish doctor from the late 19th century, um, and that he died of leptospirosis. Uh, I, and I have to say, you know, I'm in a nudge in that direction on the base of the evidence. I've consulted a lot of medics, but I have to say, a month ago, I get a letter from Jerusalem from a man who tells me the story of his father-in-law, who was an Italian Jew, who survived the war in Rome, moves to Palestine in 1945 and returns as a member of a Mossad hit squad in late 1948 to keep tabs on what Alois Hudal, the bishop, is doing. Mm. And the father-in-law, whose name is Sergio Minerbi, returns to Israel, as it then is, in August 1949, three weeks after Wächter's death. Minerbi wrote a memoir, and he talks about Hudal in the memoir. He doesn't mention Wächter. But it is possible that somewhere in an Israeli archive, there will be material which will shed light on whether Horst's theory is right. I should say Horst's theory is shared by John le Carre as I describe in the book. He believes that Wächter was subject to a hit squad, but he has no evidence for it. And uh, the speculation will go on. So, there, so there's another, there's an addendum, another book. <laughs> there is a it third book be, coming, but it's, it takes third us, book, yeah. there is a third book coming and it takes us to, um, uh, it takes us to, um, to Chile and the Pinochet case. Ah, because you were involved in that case. I was indeed. A crime yes. against humanity and a genocide. Yes. Philippe Sands, this has been absolutely wonderful. Um, I know you have another commitment with Waterstones, which is the major bookstore in the UK. Thank you for being with us. And um, I think Bonnie would like to make a comment also. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Ron. Philippe, uh, thank you so much. It's been an enormous privilege and pleasure to be able to talk to you about the rat line and for our audience to learn about your extraordinary book. Come visit us in Santa Fe again. Well, thank you, Ron, and thank you, Bonnie. I think, as I mentioned to you earlier, one of our happiest moments in a very happy long marriage was our um, our, our honeymoon in Santa Fe, where we had the great happiness of going to a place called A Thousand Waves, which I believe still exists. And when I told my wife I was with you in Santa Fe tonight, she said, why haven't we gone back? Why haven't we gone back? We will come back.